Welcome back. My name is Scott Kozak. I'm the Associate Director of Marketing and Communications at Colorado State University Global Campus. Our final panel, What Data Points Drive Non-Traditional Student Engagement or Success? Please join me in welcoming your moderator, Helen Stubbs. Helen is a senior consultant at Gallup, and she supports efforts to measure and improve the lives of college and university students, alumni, faculty, and staff. She brings a wealth of experience to her role, having served colleges and universities for more than 16 years at nonprofit national resource centers and in for-profit client service roles. Her work at these organizations involved promoting innovation and paradigm shift in how campuses create safe, healthy, and inclusive communities. Most recently, Helen led a team at a leading education technology company disseminating research tools and best practices to support college students' health, safety, and well-being. Now, I turn things over to Helen. Helen? Such a pleasure to be moderating this panel um, with a really exciting topic to round out our day. Um, so first, let me just introduce each of our panelists. I'm going to start with Matt Siegelman. Um, Matt is the CEO of Burning Glass Technologies, and for more than a decade, he's led Burning Glass in harnessing the power of data and analytics to deliver artificial intelligence technologies that have helped fill millions of jobs and provided the data needed to resolve the skills gap. Siegelman has helped establish Burning Glass as leading labor market analytics firm that is playing a growing role in informing the global debate on education and the workforce. And my next panelist is Ellen Wagner. Um, Ellen is the vice president of research at Hobson's, and she was the co-founder of the PAR or PAR framework, now uh, a division of Hobson's, and served as PAR strategy officer from its inception to its acquisition. Before joining the private sector, Ellen was a tenured professor and chair of the educational technology program at the University of Northern Colorado. Um, so welcome, Ellen. I'm, I'm uh, really eager to hear um, what, what you are contributing from your research and, and from the work you're doing at Hobson's and in previous to that. Thank you. And last but certainly not least is Sandra D'Aquisto. Uh, Sandra is the Assistant Director for, of Institutional Research at Colorado State University uh, Global. And in this ro role, she oversees institutional analytics, including retention, graduation, and student success. Uh, she has presented and published on topics uh, such as creating a data-driven organization, using data to understand students' return on investment, and redefining at-risk factors given the changing demographics of students enrolling in online education. I think it's pretty clear that, that each of our panelists were, are going to bring uh, a wealth of, of information and their own experience to this topic. The first question is really um, around this concept of, of big data. So we have heard a lot about big data um, for the past several years and businesses' uh, abilities to data mine consumer behavior in a whole host of contexts. Um, so I'd love for each of you to define what that term means for you and, and the work that you're doing here. Um, and what are some of the applications of big data in our world of higher ed and specifically, you know, thinking about the, the, um, our understanding of non-traditional students. So, so Matt, you wanna kick it off for us, please. Uh, when I think about the term big data, um, I think about this in terms of um, a couple of terms, right? One, I think, first of all, we tend to conflate the term big data with um, analysis, um, and they aren't necessarily the same thing. At the end of the day, big data um, requires a big scope of analysis, um, and I think that's a, um, a it sounds self-evident, um, but I think mean, we tend to think about um, and, and the analytics being applied to the world of higher education. And, and of course, higher education is not a, a domain that's tended to be driven uh, as numbers driven as a lot of other places have been. Um, and so to the extent that we're thinking about um, uh, being analytical in the world of higher education, we're usually thinking about analyzing um, the data sets that are internal to, uh, to the academy. Um, so whether that those be the data that are inside a student information system, um, the data that uh, reside within transcripting systems, or all the sort of data sets that um, tend to be accessible for ready analysis. The reality, of course, is that um, a, any higher education institution exists in a much broader context um, than its own information systems, um, among other things. Um, a higher education institution and its programs live within um, uh, the job market. And we know that increasingly, um, uh, you know, for students 
um, particularly working learners, but, but really across the board, students um, are very sensitive to questions of how um, a degree is going to get them ahead. Um, and um, to date, you know, I think um, it's really only been very progressive schools that have really been taking um, a look at the data around the job market and applying that to understand where um, is the uh, are the programs that we offer, where are they aligned with the market, where are they out of whack with the market, um, how do we identify better opportunities um, for programs. Those are the kinds of scopes that how do we make sure that those programs are constructed in a way that better assures student success. Those are the kinds of questions that big data analysis is designed to discover, uh, to, to inform. So that big scope of, that broader scope of analysis than just what's inside is an important facet of it. The other um, facet of what I see when I think of big data being applied in higher education is, a, um, and really uh, across the board, is the recognition that big data is oriented um, not toward big action, but toward small action. Um, and, you know, I think uh, when we look at the kinds of um, analyses that big data informs, um, it's really about getting a lot more personalized um, at the, at around specific programs, around stu specific students, um, around specific points of intersection uh, between education and careers. Um, and, and the kinds of remediations that we might take from that mm -hmm. um, around how an individual student might change lanes, um, about the last mile skills that make the difference between um, a student performing well in the, the job market and the student being underemployed. Um, those are things which um, are, are pretty small. They're very granular. Mm -hmm. um, and I think mean, that's the beauty of big data is that it lends itself toward granular um, micro insight. Thanks so much for that. So, so Ellen, do you want to take it next, please, and, and offer your insight or, and your perspective on this concept of big data? I got involved in doing some of this work looking into big data, not so much from having been an academic. As you mentioned, I, I had jumped into this work as a professor, but, oh, I would say about uh, 20 years ago or so, I was actually working in commercial software. I actually worked at companies like Adobe Systems. And I will tell you that when you start working in software companies like that, when you look at something like big data and you're working across multiple industries, you, you find, as Matt was suggesting, you, you pull large amounts of data from um, looking at transactional information. So when you look across the true use of big data, it's typically not for things like education. In fact, in education, we don't really use big data in the way that you do in retail mm -hmm. or in the way that you do in, um, say, in telecommunications where trillions and trillions of transactions can be compiled in ways that we in education really can't use the data because we're dealing with people. We're not dealing with transactions. <laughs> so um, for those of us who think we in education are really using big data to do our work, we in education really can't do that to the degree that many of us think we can. And I will illustrate this point by uh, sharing a story that, that really brought this home for me about eight years ago when um, a colleague of mine, a fellow by the name of Phil Ice, was speaking to a, a collection, a, a conference of educators, and he made the point that mathematically speaking, and really this is what big data does, is it brings mathematical sensibilities to doing the analyses that Matt mentioned. Mathematically speaking, a point of sale is identical to a learning outcome. And if you can imagine saying that to a group of educators about brought the room down, because <laughs> talking about it that way, mathematically speaking, a point of sale is not the same as a learning outcome. Except that when you bring these analytical methodologies to this conversation in big data, it actually is. So mm -hmm. for educators to start using these techniques has really been a push-pull for us because our work really hasn't reached that point yet. So what you're seeing in education right now is bringing little and medium and large sets of data to making decisions about our work in ways that is really quite different. Mm -hmm. So for many of us standing on the front edge of using data in very different ways, it's almost more of a methodological shift for many of us than it is trying to take this mathematical ability to use data, but in education, we're still not able to generalize like that. For us in education, trying to push the boundaries of generalizability mm -hmm. is really what it's all about.
So, you know, exciting times for us, but these are baby steps in education for us, which is why I think it's very exciting, but which is why I think the stuff we're going to be talking about here as we move ahead is, is really where a lot of us are going to be able to stretch and grow and come up with new ways of being able to think differently about our practices. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and, and Sandra, um, given your work, and, and I'm curious to, to hear what your, your take is and your perspective of this concept of big data and how, um, how you view that and, and how you're applying it to the work that you're doing. I, I echo what Ellen had said that in many ways, higher ed has kind of come late to the big data game and we're really just now um, you know, yes, some schools have really been, like she said, on the forefront of it, but for the vast majority, especially those schools that tend to be much more traditional focused, these are whole new ideas. People sometimes don't even know really how to think about it, how to use data, um, how to make decisions that are uh, actionable and then reevaluate to see if the data have improved. Um, so to answer your actual question, um, what I would say here at CSU Global, you know, we try to bring in all of the data that we can from all kinds of places. And some of that is from our learning management system, as far as patterns mm -hmm. of students logging in, where they're going, interacting, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it is data, uh, you know, like the burning glass data and looking at skills out there and where our graduates have been placed. And we try to put all of that together to understand what students need recognizing that our students are perhaps different now than they were 10 years ago mm -hmm. and how do we make sure that they have a return on investment that is and it's meaningful experience and that they get a job that they want or that they advance their career in the way they want so for us it's trying to put together all of these in many ways still small and medium but more than we've ever had put all of those data sets together so that we can really understand students um, at a much more in-depth, detailed, and granular level than we ever have in the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Um, well, I'm I'm really uh, looking forward to sort of diving into this further with with each of you and 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 hearing what you're learning through through some of that uh, examination. Um, I want to now just shift it and and I actually have a question for for you, Ellen. Um, and it's really. Um, just around sort of the value of the data. And if you could just provide um, a glimpse of how you're using the data to, to provide a perspective in, in terms of the various stages of a student life cycle from all the way from um, the research around um, enrollment and uh, maybe even pre-enrollment um, all the way through to completion and, and maybe even beyond that if, if um, you're, you're collecting data around some of those outcomes. Um, so, so we would really love to hear kind of um, how you're employing data at each of those, those stages in the life cycle. You bet. I'm, I'm going to do something daring here, which is I'm going to share my screen real quickly and just show you okay. um, a diagram. How's that for uh, using the technology? Pushing the envelope here a little bit. Share with you this particular uh, little arc of student success because we are using this type of um, information, as you were saying. At Hobson's, you know, we actually deal with this idea of student success where we start looking at things really from the college and career readiness and then have to really think about this. If we are trying to get students ready for college or career, they are looking at trying to get ready for what they have to do to move into that particular world. And then of course, you know, you're looking at things like standard benchmarks. I mean, yes, we do look at standardized testing, not as the complete student, but to get a snapshot on how well do they compare with other students? How well are they doing in their classes? You know, if we're not just talking about going to college, and we heard that in the last session for how the students are really looking to get ready. And of course, if they're looking for jobs, how are they starting to know about what's available for them to, to dream about? Because really, you can't be what you can't see. So if if you're not thinking about what you want to be when you grow up, you don't even know how to prepare for that. You don't know what industry is expecting of you knowing what to study. Uh, if you don't get out and start understanding what people expect of you in your community, you don't even know what to prepare for. So the idea of thinking you can just think about college as you start applying, well, no, you've really got to think about getting ready and how you compare for getting ready to do that type of work. But as you start thinking about 
what happens next? How do you compare? How do you match with the schools? You know, are you ready academically to apply for different colleges? Are you ready professionally to think about certain types of apprenticeship programs or different types of, um, of, of different type of professional, uh, professional types of experiences? Not only are you ready academically or to fit there, but how are you feeling about the fit? Will you, will you feel like you belong in a particular place? And that matters as much as whether or not you are academically prepared. The processes of applying, of actually um, getting admitted to a place also depends on your data. And mm -hmm. then over here on the side, you can actually see some of the college completion information, the data about your learner characteristics and the behaviors that you bring in and your academic um, fit in your environment and the social and psychological ways in which you work. There are data points collected at every one of these. And the, the reality is that as you prepare for college or if we're trying to keep you ready to stay in college and to complete the experience, we are collecting, as I said before, small data, medium data, and uh, comprehensive data at every point of a student's life cycle. And if we're not thinking about using these data consistently and reliably and repeatably and generalizability, then we are all missing a big point. Now, the reality in education is we've been collecting information on students since there have been students in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have perhaps not been using this information systematically, or that perhaps we haven't been collecting the information systematically, so mm -hmm. that I will say one of the things I've discovered in the last 10, 15 years or so of really looking systematically at data is, gee whiz, we're not collecting the things that we can use, say, from elementary schools to middle schools, mm -hmm. and from middle schools to high schools. And guess what? Between high schools and colleges, data goes like this. We're not even collecting the same types of things that we want to fit. And we all understand that when we're dealing with transfer, well, transfer is an issue that we all understand, and we've been seeing reports coming out, that if you're taking classes from one institution and trying to apply from someplace else, and we have mismatches of up to 40% on transfer, well, we're discovering these things because our data systems have finally gotten to the point where we understand that, guess what? Data systems really aren't working together because they actually don't even compare, well, let's, we're, we're comparing apples to zebras in some cases. I think uh, um, the point that the LMSs don't necessarily correlate with the SISs and that if we're really trying to pull other systems together, they don't fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. So um, rather than beating this particular horse into the ground, I will say that the good news is, is that as we bring our data systems forward and we're looking for the places for things to correlate and to fit, we're discovering that in fact, gee, maybe that's a place that it's time to really start thinking, you know, the more that we reveal what we're looking at, the more we've realized, holy cow, we've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I really appreciate that visual. So thanks for sharing your screen and allowing us some, some insight. I'm, I am a visual learner um, myself. So uh, really appreciate the diagram of kind of mapping that out for us. I realized um, there was no way I could imagine a great semicircle <laughs> put things together. So I'm glad that helped. That's great. Thank you. Um, I want to now shift over. I uh, actually have a question for Sandra. Um, so much of the value of online ed is that, you know, of course, it is technology driven, which um, is allowing us some really detailed data tracking um, and measurement of outcomes um, on a whole host of levels. So. Um, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about um, your use of technology in the online ed space and how it's enabling um, you to do some, some rich data uh, analysis um, of, of the students at CSU Global. Sure, sure. It, you know, in some ways, it, my IR life is much easier in an online setting because of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, in my old non-traditional, in my old traditional on-ground campus life, um, you basically had to have faculty members collect assessments on paper or in Excel. Hypothetically, then somebody might input it somewhere. Over time, we might could have a data set. Mm -hmm. Now, in technology and the fact that everything is online in courses, all of those types of transactions, grades, it, logging ins, interactions, posting to the discussion, all of those things are instantly captured because it's all in a, in a software, in a technology system. Mm -hmm. And 
what that does for us is not only do we have very rich data coming out of our LMS, we have rich data that we're collecting from students in other ways, such as surveys, um, you know, we use a soft, uh, in an online so survey software, of course. So then we can send surveys to students where they can give feedback. We can tie that back to then all of the data in our student information system. Mm -hmm. And then we have all of these systems, all of these data, and then further using technology, we have a way that we can put them all together um, using our business intelligence uh, type of software. Our, our, we use Tableau here for visualization. Mm -hmm. So basically because everything is captured in all of these systems and we know how to pull data from systems and put it together, we are able to have such robust reports that a, in a traditional setting might would take years to create and to get to. And we have it for every student, every term, every faculty, every, every, every interaction, every time an advisor speaks to a student we know. We know all of those things. And, and that is just worlds better than when it's not online, frankly. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, of course I love online ed, clearly, um, mm -hmm. but, but really it's, it just makes it so much easier and we just have it instantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. And uh, I love some of the examples. I'd actually love to hear a couple more examples from you, Sandra, of the, the kinds of, uh, and just to demonstrate the variety of, of data that you're collecting. I mean, what are some of those bits of information that you're feeding into sort of your robust system? And um, just, just to give us a sense of, of, of where you're collecting and how you're collecting that data. Sure, sure. So, um, for example, on the front end, um, when a student, a prospective student speaks to our admissions team, our admissions team actually asks them, what are your motivations? What are your goals? What are you after? And even though that's very qualitative and it's words, so to speak, rather than, um, you know, a number, we still can bring that in and back it up to things like GPA and retention. If you are motivated um, by your boss told you you have to get a degree or you're not going to move forward in your career. Are you, for instance, um, a stronger student than somebody who says, you know, I just, I wanted to do this my whole life, so I'm doing it. Now, mm -hmm. we actually found that that wasn't the case, that there wasn't necessarily a difference. But mm -hmm. that's kind of a great example of how we can take something away from the beginning of the student life cycle when they're first coming in, then take a look at it and then mm -hmm. decide, does, do we need to take action? Mm -hmm. Then once we know this student, um, you know, if this student has these kinds of uh, qualities, for instance, they have low, low transfer credits, or they're coming in with a lower GPA, they've been out for a long time, a host of other types of, um, you know, ac their previous academic history, all of those things, then we can put that together. And, you know, we actually kind of come up with who is potentially at risk. And then the people that are potentially at risk, then the advisors may reach out to them more if that's what's deemed as um, appropriate for, for that kind of population or intervention. Or similarly for some of our other populations, um, we've put them into a special version of a course that would be a little more high touch because those students through the data we know are at risk if they because they need a higher, a little higher touch. So mm -hmm. we collect all of this, put things together, put data from our, the front end, then take a look at their interactions with their advisors, their faculty. Are they logging into the class? Yes, yes, okay, you're good. But this one, uh oh, you fell off. Let's reach out. Let's make sure you're okay. And then on the back end, of course, we're looking at where our graduates are winding up. Are, are they improving their salaries? Are, is their livelihood better because of their attendance at CSU Global? Mm -hmm. So once we know that, then we bring it back or again to the very front. How do we then serve the next round of students even better knowing what we know from our alumni? for where they're working, what industries, uh, how satisfied they were with us, their own, you know, suggestions for improvements. We ask students mm -hmm. for their feedback all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I hopefully that answered your question with some oh, yeah. examples. Um, but it's, it's just, it's, I get so excited. I stumble over my words. I get so excited about the data because um, it, it's just, like I say, in a traditional setting, you just can't get all of that together. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you can, but it takes a long time and possibly a lot of resources and 
way too much data clean up in Excel, I can tell you. Oh yeah, no, well, I, I know that well from our, our work in, in at Gallup, working with, with campuses and, and um, most of the time we're working with people in, in IR and, and um, I've, I felt that pain myself. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate that, that perspective of kind of, again, across the life cycle, um, as Ellen gave us a glimpse of that into her work at Hobson's, um, you sort of seeing that on the ground um, uh, with, with your work um, at CSU Global. So from there, I'd love to, to now um, shift gears slightly and, and, and hear from Matt. Um, Matt, and, and thinking about sort of on, on um, and this is actually a great segue from, from Sandra's last point around sort of once students move out into the world of, of employment, um, just to hear about, you know, the labor market and the data that you're collecting on the employment side of things, both um, from the perspective of um, employers and, and hiring managers, um, but also thinking about students and alumni um, and how they're making career-minded decisions around sort of their trajectory and, you know, how does that affect their educational decisions. Um, so we'd love to hear how da the data that you're collecting is playing a role in that. Absolutely. Um, though, you know, to some extent, um, as you just uh, described, um, the the both the challenge and the opportunity. It's it's in one ways about the back end. How do we extend the definition of success beyond graduation to understand um, career outcomes? But it actually challenge us to think even a little bit more broadly. Mm -hmm. We're used to thinking about this and using the lexicon of an education to career gap. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people sort of talk in that language and how we can be uh, more successful at education to careers. But um, the reality of, um, of the higher education world um, broadly, certainly um, with um, so much learning happening today in online environments like CSU Global, um, we're seeing that more and more um, the higher education universe is becoming um, defined by um, working learners. And in the world of working learners, it's not really about education to careers. It is um, about career to education to career, or perhaps actually even more precisely thinking about these as parallel lines. And I think Sandra was talking a little bit about that, about understanding what is somebody's um, employment trajectory? What are their employment motivations? Um, are they here for self-actualization or are they here because they're looking to get ahead in their career? Um, and increasingly, um, we know that many, for working learners, many of them are really um, motivated primarily by that opportunity to either move up within their career um, to be able to at least stay in place in, in careers where employers are saying, hey, you know, you can't, you, know, you can't even stay if you don't have a bachelor's degree, um, or about how to, um, to actually um, affect some career mobility. In any of those kinds of frames, it's important to think about what's, what's that starting point. Now, one of the reasons I want to, to, to sort of think about it in those terms, and why the vocabulary is actually really important here, is that when we think about the world of employment and education being parallel lines, it changes, um, it really essentially challenges the structure and the granularity of education um, in some pretty significant ways, um, such that um, education increasingly really becomes defined by um, a currency of skills rather than degrees. Right? Mm -hmm. If I'm a worker, I'm working in a given kind of job, um, you know, for me to move up in my career um, may not take acquiring a whole other degree. It takes acquiring sets of skills. And so, um, you know, to with the, the previous panel, you have to have that visibility to know what those skills are. Um, but you also need to have an educational structure that is um, much more oriented around competence-based learning in the way CSU Global is um, and others are. To be able to say, hey, how do I um, define what are those skills and competencies that I need to add um, and where do they get me? In, when you can reframe learning, as being about skills rather than degrees, or you know, that may eventually translate to degrees. Um, it, it opens up sort of a fabulous set of possibilities because what it, it tells you actually is that learning is the unique opportunity that people have to arbitrage in themselves. 
right? I can um, be in my current job, um, let's say I'm a graphic designer and I'm making $54,000 a year. Um, if I um, learn front end web development, um, I will be making $76,000 a year, right? So it doesn't cost me $22,000 to learn HTML5. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and, and you know, and the list goes on. And, and it's really sort of any part of the educational spectrum of, of, the, uh, of the career spectrum, of the educational spectrum, these kinds of arbitrage opportunities exist. If I'm an admin, learning Salesforce um, gives me a $5,000 premium. Um, if I am a marketing manager, um, you know, marketing manager jobs overall um, are not that hard to fill. Um, but it's really hard for employers to find marketing people who know how to build a customer database um, and to to um, to run queries on that database. Just learning as plain of vanilla data skill as SQL fetches you a thirteen thousand dollar premium. Right? So when you can start to deconstruct um, the university and recognize the university has um, this wealth of content that's really valuable to learners. It's valuable to employers and start to make that um, just create smaller bundles that are oriented toward career mobility and career transition. Um, it opens up, first of all, a, a huge um, set of revenue opportunities for, for schools, but even more powerfully for learners and employers, it allows um, higher education institutions to be critical partners um, for employers um, as, as they sort of look to continue to increase the productivity and skill level of their, of their employees and for learners to make sure that they actually are um, activating themselves mm -hmm. over the course of a career. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, so I, I love that shift that you, you've just articulated in, in thinking more about sort of specific skill sets um, or even a particular mm -hmm. skill and how that can really um, help advance somebody and, and their, their own marketability um, and their career. And, and you know, how do you think, um, by and large, higher ed is doing in terms of articulating that value, uh, the value to non-traditional learners? Um, and, and where is that working well, do you think? You know, I think um, it's, it's still pretty early days for most um, institutions. I think for the most part, um, higher education institutions lack um, both the structures to serve working learners um, and also the vocabulary. I think, you know, vocabulary matters so much here um, because, um, you know, again, as I mentioned before, in a lot of cases, the content's there, but we're not really calling out um, its career value. Mm -hmm. um, and so that makes it very difficult for, um, for working learners to say, hey, look, this is why I should pursue this degree. This is why I should pursue this course um, because it's going to help me accrue a set of skills um, and so, you know, we lack both the articulation of that, um, uh, you know, that sort of job market vocabulary around learning. Um, and then I think there's a great opportunity that, um, you know, we're working with some universities to track right now, uh, or to crack right now, rather, which is how do you help somebody understand um, the universe of upward opportunities as relates to them? This gets back to the notion that big data is really about small or, or personalized or micro decisions, right? So for me, if I'm working as, to go use that as an example again of a, uh, of a um, marketing manager, right? Here's the kind of directions I can go. Um, and here's therefore the specific skill prescriptions, if you will, that I need to acquire. And, and so I think there's some, we're starting to work with some universities to have to make sure that they can have that conversation with students on the way in so they can sort of come up with a personalized prescription for um, upward mobility and translate that to learning. Now, one thing I do want to point out, um, you know, it's easy to, to, to look at this and say, well, gee, you know, he's saying it's skills, not degrees, and therefore, um, universities are at a disadvantage here because there's boot camps and there's MOOCs and, and others um, who have really sort of um, built their business models around, um, you know, sort of micro learning or tapas learning, as I like to call it, tastes better. Um, the, um, 
the thing to bear in mind, though, is that while the, um, the currency of learning needs to be about skills, the um, degrees still matter. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and, um, and so the ability to take a traditional university structure and a tr traditional university catalog in its full breadth um, and be able to translate it to a competency-based structure where people are still acquiring Carnegie units, essentially, mm -hmm. um, is really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately I would not, not count out universities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I see you're trying to interject. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Matt takes a break there and get some water. Um, well, Ellen, yeah. It's not so much interject as it is. I think Matt made a point that these are different business models and that this has been a huge transition for universities to even think about business models. Yeah. Uh, my days back in universities uh, not so long ago was that if you were in a university and you were thinking about business models, you weren't a part of the university that was considered non-traditional that the traditional institution, in fact, was in the business of doing very different things. So without judgment, I think we are talking about a very different shift and that the online institutional model was the one that, in fact, has forced a very different conversation. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, we can even have, the fact that we are even having this conversation is, in fact, one of the biggest in innovations of the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that let's give ourselves a big round of applause that, in mm -hmm. fact, online has forced an innovation in uh, colleges and universities that most traditionalists would never have believed was going to happen. So this has broadened the opportunity for us to even think this way for non-traditional or the post-traditional learner mm -hmm. that has really opened doors for us to, to be thinking about this that, um, that I think is, is fabulous. And we are really talking about, about a currencies. Mm -hmm. um, the currency of exchange for documenting the you know, skills, how awesome that we can even have this as a university-based conversation. Mm -hmm. But let's not forget that this is part of, of a menu of opportunity where a degree which is still available as um, maybe not so much skills-based, but as your entry level for then being able to build upon that for skills, credentials, micro-credentials, so that this panoply of opportunity to build yourself into the person you can be mm -hmm. in multiple ways. Um, I mean, this is new, folks. I mean, the fact mm -hmm. that there are now institutions that can serve people in this, this fabulous smorgasbord of learning opportunities, um, I mean, this this is this is the leading edge for yeah. for so many of us. That um, I, that was what I wanted to interject. That we are we are we are we are bleeding edge uh, bleeding edge innovators. The fact mm -hmm. that we are able to talk about this. So right. yay data. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, both of you. Um, I want to also just be mindful of time, and and I've got a few more questions here, and then we're going to open it up to the the questions from the um, from the participants. So thinking about um, some of the outcomes that I think that the higher ed has really struggled with, specifically um, student retention and, and graduation rates um, and, and, and the challenge that they have posed, um, what role can data play in uh, developing solutions and, and um, really allowing us to focus and hone in on um, the, the right, you know, sort of points of inflection if it, uh, uh, as you might, you know, sort of think about how, how we create solutions around those. So um, uh, I'll open it up to to whomever. I, I see uh, um, Matt, you're you're looking you're looking like you've got something to offer here, and then then we'll open it to the others. For sure. Um, so you know, when I think about retention, one of the first things that I think is is important to bear in mind is that um, retention and starts and enrollment. Um, when we can do a better job of pairing people with the right sets of programs, um, when we can help make people make eyes wide open decisions about what they're going to do, um, it has it goes a, a huge way toward improving um, uh, you know ultimate completion outcomes. I, I think one of the other key facets, and again this this is full life cycle that I think is really important. There's been so much progress made on retention um, around. Um, being able to analyze and some of the kinds of things that, um, like in Starfish, um, like being able to look at how students are, um, are doing in their courses and all that kind of stuff. One thing which 
um, I think is a important element of this as well. Is really, again, thinking about the structure um, or again, the business model of education. Um, and I think about, you know, one of the biggest challenges um, for higher education, and again, this is true across the board, it's especially true for working learners, is that um, it is a um, supreme exercise in deferred gratification. Mm -hmm. right? You're going to start a program and it's going to be multiple years um, before, even if let's say you're a stop out and you've got 80 credit hours and you're going to do another, you know, um, and you're going to go down the rest of the road, you're working, right? So this is not something that's going to happen in a semester or two in most cases. Um, and so as a result, um, it's easy for, as the saying goes, for life to get in the way. Um, and I think one of the opportunities here is um, to crack that deferred gratification cycle by being able to um, call out um, and signpost for, uh, for learners um, why they're learning what they're learning, how it relates to their end goals. And ideally, you know, again, if you can create a, a frame that ensures that they are acquiring skills that are in a sequence that makes them usable, then right out the gate, they are very quickly accruing benefit from what they're doing. So it's, it's not, hey, trust us, um, you know, eat kale and, and you know, at, at some point down the road, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have big muscles or, or, you know, you'll live an extra 10 years, um, 40 or 50 years from now. Um, but instead it's saying, hey, look, right away, here's something that's some benefit that's going to accrue. When we can change the language and the structure of higher education to attach much more to the language and structure of work, um, I think we'll score some huge goals from a retention perspective. Huge win. Great. Great. Thanks. Um, Sandra, did you want to chime in there? Just thinking about um, retention and, and, and graduation and um, how you're, you all are thinking about that at, at CSU Global. Uh, yes. I do actually want to jump in. Um, I, so for us, I, I would say that traditional higher ed approached traditional students as if though they were the same. And it was this concept that when you are 18 to 23 and you are in college, you will behave this way. There'll be no parents. We have to do these things. And that's how you serve this entire population. But really, students are very different and there's many, many populations. And now when we get to quote unquote, the non-traditionals or the new traditional, I say, um, we know that there are very different groups of people. They're, they come from all walks of life. They have all kinds of challenges. So our, what we try to use our data for is to really understand certain populations, take a look at um, what, what, what if for this segment and this population that struggles with this, how do we serve them? Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking, how do we serve all students? Mm -hmm. And we could never do that without the rich data that we have. We, we wouldn't have the insight um, that we have if we, if we, one, if we didn't collect as much as we do because we are online and it comes so easy as a collection. Mm -hmm. um, but two, it, it, it's... We don't know. We don't know about these learners. It's not like when you go, you can read literature and uh, all the answers are there. The, you, these, this is a population that no one knows, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And so now with these data, we're trying to understand how do we serve individuals mm -hmm. and not all students. And the same goes for graduation, too. I mean, if you don't retain them, they're certainly not going to get um, their degree at the end. And so we, we look at short term, long term. Um, we, we try to pinpoint at risk, like I said. So that's how we're using data to really drive retention and graduation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. How about you, Ellen? What, what would you oh, offer? Sure. I mean, just, I mean, just a, a, it's sort of an open question, but I mean, think about any other industry where if you were admitting people into your business and you had to let 40% of them go mm -hmm. because of bad selection, I mean, what does that say about your industry? I mean, really, mm -hmm. that's not on the students. That's sort of on mm -hmm. us as educators, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, you know, that's just sort of a, like that's not that's not on the students. That's just really horrific selection processes on us. So, 
I think that one of the one of the best things about actually taking a really good look at our own practices, which we've been able to do now, once you take a look at the data, is that we had a chance to be able to say, oh, bad on us as mm -hmm. as as deciders about mm -hmm. how we were doing our own work. And mm -hmm. I think that really that sort of self-reflection on our own practice has been one of the best things we could have been able to find out about ourselves. Because once you see that, I think to Sandra's point, you know, we're, we're going out looking for people to put a little alumni stamp, you know, stamping out grads to look just like a perfect, you know, grad of whatever institution we happen to be from, um, getting smarter about being able to help students realize the, you know, the, the good old American dream of being able to achieve that you know, either the college degree of their choice or the career path of their choice or the skill development of their choice or they establish the career of their dreams. I mean, listen, that's really sort of, you know, we as educators or people who are education stakeholders really have, you know, that, you know, it's the moral obligation really of being able to help, you know, if we say that this is what we're in the business of being able to do, it's up to us to be able to help find those pathways so that student success is not just a platitude or a meme or a, 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 a marketing opportunity. It's, it's really the, what we've all signed up to be able to get behind and, and help deliver on. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for reminding us, Ellen. Sometimes you can lose track, right? The, the, the big mission, the bold mission here. Um, I want to just, you know, being mindful of time, ask um, Scott if there are any questions coming in. I just have one question from the audience that I'd like to pose to the group, and then I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Ellen. Okay, great. How can big data analysis help instructors personalize their instruction to students? So this sounds like a, a really good one um, for you, Sandra. Curious how um, you're thinking about sort of that, that concept of personalization. It, it sort of speaks to your, your previous point about kind of really honing in on individual student needs. In some ways, big data are like the little data too. As a faculty member, as you've taught a course, um, perhaps you teach a math course and you've taught it um, one, two, three, five, ten times, you, you yourself kind of know, oh, students didn't like that. Oh, that assignment, it really didn't work for them. Oh man, they, they bombed this piece of the test. We, we need to tweak some um, content in this regard so that they're better prepared. And so on a little scale, mo many faculty are doing that already and they're already working towards um, personalizing and understanding their students and tweaking things. Mm -hmm. On a big scale though, when, you, when you're really talking about big data and in our context uh, in the online setting, now we can look across uh, age populations, uh, groups of students. Um, so, you know, if you have a class that's abundantly military, you you will be more prepared to know how to serve military because we are sharing data with faculty understanding the challenges um, that maybe are unique to military students for instance mm -hmm. or similarly if um, for example if you are a faculty member in a program and you know that that program is um, for instance our criminal justice program we know that many of our students are in law enforcement like they may come with similar challenges to military students um, based on what kinds of jobs they have so faculty at least in our context, because we can look at whole populations, their interactions in courses, what kinds of assignments they like, what they don't like, what discussion questions just didn't spark any interest versus what questions really got a whole course lit up. Then we can share that with other faculty members, then we can add it into other courses, um, and it really just becomes this robust list of best practices that we know work for our students and then we can share it with faculty across the board. Mm -hmm. um, but don't underestimate the little data too because I think that f faculty are on the front lines always with our students and w they know often if things need to change or what the best is. It's just nice that we have it across mm -hmm. all courses, all levels, all programs, all students, all faculty. Yeah and, and to Helen, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to to Sandra's point, uh, it's the insights that we get from these data, which I think are sometimes the more important part of actionability. Mm -hmm. And I think that, because that was a point that Sandra had made early on, part of what, what has been so exciting about these data really is that we can take action, we can do something about it. And sometimes it's just the insight that we get from seeing things differently. Sometimes that we, we see a pattern we didn't see before. Mm -hmm. And we think about it in a different way. And sometimes it's just that insight 
that helps right. us see things differently. We get to shift our perspectives. Right. And, uh, and sometimes that's the richest, the richest finding of all right. that, um, that we should never, never, never look past the fact that seeing things differently is, is sometimes just the, the catalyst we need for being able to, to, to bring a whole new way of thinking about our work in really different ways. That's great. Yeah, I love that. Um, and, and really, I think speaks to to the value of just both, you know, the big data and the little data together and, and kind of how they can come together um, to to really help us improve our own practice um, over time. So one last question, and, and um, then we can release folks to uh, to the rest of their day. Um, and, and this is sort of now looking, you know, we, we talked about retention and graduation, sort of looking at um, other kinds of graduate outcomes. Um, and do you think uh, universities are doing a good job of measuring graduate outcomes? Um, I know that that's certainly something that Gallup has spent a lot of time uh, focusing on and, and sort of shifting the conversation around. But, um, but and, and, and how do you think camp, uh, campuses, or rather universities, I should say, are making um, the data around graduate outcomes readily available to not only prospective students, but also to employers? Um, how might it be improved? So um, I guess let's let's start with you, Matt, as you're you're in the frame here, um, thinking about sure. that that communication. So I, I, first of all, um, it gets me really excited to know that um, we are starting to to um, broaden our view beyond the uh, the university's walls. Mm -hmm. um, that's um, in you know sort of the same way as we were talking before about how we're seeing really. Um, data create all uh, a whole new frame on on the business model of education and and the way it's delivered. I think in much the same way we're seeing um, a significant revolution in terms of um, the definition of success. Mm -hmm. um, student success traditionally was defined as um, completion, mm -hmm. um, and I think we're now increasingly um, in some cases it's a legislative focus, but I think in a lot of cases it's because the the silver lining of the very dark cloud of, of the Great Recession and its anemic recovery has been that um, students uh, and prospective students, even more importantly, are asking tough questions about where is it going to take me. Um, so, so first, you know, great that we're even asking that kind of question. That said, um, I, uh, you know, I think we tend to think about the question of tracking student outcomes and reporting. Um, to prospective learners and others, uh, other constituents of education, um, with regard to um, you know, with regard to outcomes in a very literal way. Right? So we say, okay, well, let's let's track what happens with people over time, and then let's see where they go. And logically, um, that makes a lot of sense um, until you start thinking about it. First of all. Um, all of us in the field know that that's a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on these really difficult alumni surveys that, you know, people may or may not respond to and you can do your best to try to uh, corner people, but it's expensive and it's hard and, and um, it's, there's a lot of bias in there. Um, or you can say, hey, look, and, and, and then, you know, one other thing, which another issue then, is that intrinsically now that you've, okay, now I've watched people, a cohort of people over the course of 10 years, and now I know what happens to people 10 years out. Well, doesn't that mean I'm driving the car in the rearview mirror? I know how a, a cohort of students who started in 2007 um, have borne out in 2017, but I actually don't know how my program is performing today. And the market has, is very dynamic, right? So um, whether a program was aligned in 2007 may or may not mean whether it's aligned in 2017. So um, the good news is, I think there's actually much more efficient, much more real-time ways of looking at this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, it, it's it, at some level it's imperfect to say, hey, how well lined up is what I'm teaching with what the market is looking for? Um, it is certainly an imperfect perfect proxy, but I would say it is actually a dramatically better proxy, nonetheless, than relying on what the market was looking for 10 years out. Um, and so being able to simply report on what's the career value of the program that where that you're thinking about um, in terms of how much demand there is um, in your local market, um, you know, what uh, what kind of compensation those kinds of careers are going to offer at the entry level 
and then uh, to people with some level of experience? And then how much are the individual skills that comprise that program worth? Um, so again, that you can actually um, think about this in more granular terms. That stuff that can be tracked right out the gate um, doesn't require um, a huge investment. Um, and I think actually can be a lot more instructive for learners um, and prospective learners um, than you know, what happened 10 years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. Ellen, did you have something to share? Um, okay, how about you, Sandra, were you? Uh, um, sure, I feel like I always have a little something to say. <laughs> Um, I would say, it, in general, there are some schools that are doing it great, and it, this is what is driving, I mean, for instance, CSU Global, we are very driven by ensuring a return on investment, and that our programs are aligned, and that success is more than completion. But I would say that traditionally speaking, it's been a struggle. As Matt said, I mean, you get a, you could give a survey and then you get the people that are so delighted and excited because they got a great new job. And so then it looks like everybody gets a great new job when you didn't hear from maybe some of the students that really could give some good feedback or whatnot. Um, I would say, though, that in the past, we didn't have any access. There wasn't great data to get other than a survey. Mm -hmm. Now, with organizations such as Burning Glass, for instance, there is just so much data, so much so rich insights that we can get because we have those types of data now. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the old days, you literally had a survey. That was it. Now you have services where you can actually look and see where are your students employed. The, the students don't have to tell you. You can know because they have it on their LinkedIn. So, you know, now we're in a place where the heat is on for the schools that aren't doing this because students as consumers demand it. And it's awesome where we are, especially for some of us that have been on that cutting edge of it and, you know, just trying to consume those data every second that we can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, I, I'm being mindful of time and I, I'm going to apologize to our participants. We haven't left a whole lot of time here for uh, the networking that we've been doing throughout the day. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, Scott, how we've done around, I, I, you said that you did have a, one question and, and we've asked that. So um, hope that we've, we've provided answers to everyone's questions here. This has been a really great panel. So Thank you so much uh, to the panelists for, for your sharing your insights here on, on such a really interesting topic. This has been wonderful. It has been fantastic, a, a great discussion. Thank you, Helen, Sandra, Matt, Ellen. It's been outstanding. Um, now it is time to conclude our conference for today. I wanna to offer our greatest thanks to all our speakers, panelists, and moderators for their time and participation we learned a lot. It was great insights. I'd also like to thank all our participants for joining us today. I hope you found the information useful and insightful for your work. On behalf of everyone at Colorado State University Global Campus, thank you and goodbye.